If you've been an OpenShift customer for a while, you know that roughly six times a year we do a what's new in OpenShift, the version that just released, in this case version 4.14 just came out a few short days ago, um, and soon thereafter we're going to do a what's next. Um, so you're going to get kind of a sneak preview of both of those in a small session, and then the speakers and I will all be available afterwards to, to talk about anything specifically that you wanted to talk about. But when we look at uh, what's going into OpenShift, what the future is, um, and even like the value that we want to present to uh, customers, uh, we focus on these three areas that really drive the roadmap. First is our trusted background as uh, the leaders in open source, in Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and all the work we do there. We've designed you know, a platform that all of you are using today to build innovative solutions on top of. And this year, we've had some great uh, validation of that. Uh, we were named uh, the, uh, in the leader quadrant for the magic quadrant for uh, container management by Gartner. We're the leader in the Forrester wave for multi-cloud uh, management. And we started the year off by being able to announce that we had a billion dollars in, in revenue, so the second Red Hat business to hit that level. We also, through the work we do in the community, but the work we also do with customers and our ecosystem partners, we help to curate this complete solution. So we do a lot of integration work with uh, existing open source projects. We bring some of those into OpenShift. Others, we work with our community members to uh, advance them and get them to be enterprise ready. And then we have a large ecosystem of customers and uh, uh, OEMs and vendors that we work with. Uh, we just announced uh, Dell Apex Cloud Platform. Um, and if you get a chance on the show floor, go check out the Dell booth. We're running the actual hardware. And uh, it's a really great meeting of the minds for uh, bringing OpenShift on quickly. And then consistency, uh, having a consistent uh, experience for developers, regardless of where OpenShift is. And for platform engineers, there's always going to be details of implementation that are specific to a footprint, but we do our best to make sure that most of your skills are transferable, whether you're running us in the cloud or on-prem or in a cloud apex uh, box in the data center. And we listen to our customers and we talk to uh, the market as well. So we run surveys like this from the enterprise open source uh, state of the market. Uh, we also do one for, for Kubernetes security. Uh, you're going to hear a lot at, at KubeCon in general, but also here today and at our sessions in the booth on AI. Edge computing, we just announced this morning uh, the release of Red Hat Device Edge, which is the productization of MicroShift, uh, you know, along with RHEL for Edge, container serverless computing. We're always trying to get to the heartbeat of what folks are looking at today and what may become reality tomorrow. And we are doing that for customers. You know, we started off with cloud native applications, um, you know, net new greenfield implementations, but we're seeing a lot of traditional apps being refactored and new workloads like AIML, like Edge, that are driving our vision for what we want to present to our customers. And you know, I think 10 years ago when we started OpenShift, we we delivered it one way as a managed service, and then about you know, seven or eight years ago, we moved to uh, Kubernetes and we took it all into self-managed software. What we heard from customers is that our customers wanted it that way, but they also wanted to manage it themselves. They wanted a managed service. They want it in the data center. They want it at the edge. And so a lot of the growth that we've seen over the course of the last few years is offering uh, both on premises and in the public cloud our self-managed offerings. Um, now with our OEM partners offering uh, pre-configured uh, drop, uh, drop shipping, zero, zero touch installation uh, with, with Apex on Dell and GreenLake with HPE. Uh, managed services with AWS, Azure, IBM, and Google. Um, we offer these in our regular subscriptions, one year and three year up front. We offer them now pay as you go through our hyperscaler partners. You can go to the 
AWS marketplace, you can buy Rosa, which is the managed service, or you can buy OpenShift, manage it yourself, pay by the hour. Usage models, uh, again, uh, for, for companies that want uh, Edge, we offer Edge now. So the consistency is now available uh, through all of these different footprints, all these different instantiations, and that's part of the value we bring to our customers that we hope you get to take advantage of and ask us about uh, during the course of the week. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, William to talk about what's going on in OpenShift. Good morning. Okay, let's take a closer look to what some of the things we are working for OpenShift for the upcoming releases. And let's start by the way we're running applications. Nowadays, organizations really require their applications to run pretty much anywhere, across multiple clusters, cloud, location, and even multi-art cluster. With that in mind, here's some of the things we're working with. In OpenShift Service Mesh, we are extending its support for multi-cluster and multi-arc support for ARM64. Similarly, we're working on, with OpenShift Service Mesh to enable dual stack IPv6, IP4 for those clients that require that. We know that GitOps is the way that, the preferred way to do application management and deployment. And for those, usually they are combined with Helm. So with that in mind, we are working on support for the dynamic value lookup for Helm on Argo CD. At the same time, we are working enhancing the canary deployment with Argo rollout. There are many multi-tenant clusters. So we are also working now with a new lifecycle model for the lifecycle of Kubernetes operators. Specifically, this will allow tenants to have their own instance of an operator. What about developers? So developers are really the backbone of the innovation that is happening today. So with that in mind, in OpenShift, we want to provide the best self-service experience possible. For that, first, we are working on graduating the developer hub to support new end-to-end -end workflows together with a series of plugins, basically integrating the developer's favorite tools into the developer hub. But we don't stop there. Let's say that you are a developer that want to work offline or in your laptop. Well, we have OpenShift Local. That allows you to run the OpenShift bits, but in a format that is really specific, usable for your workstation or laptop. Let's say that you need an environment right away. You cannot wait for your IT department. That's fine. Developer sandbox. You can go to the developer portal and you can on demand get this developer sandbox where you can get an OpenShift cluster for you with the developer tools that you need. Now let's say that you're one of those developers that really want to try the latest and greatest technologies. Fine, we are bringing WebAssembly, or WASM, and Python to uh, OpenShift serverless. So you'll be able to also use these technologies all the way from your data center all the way to the edge. And don't forget Potman desktop, which allows you to run in a very nice user experience, run and develop containers in your laptop. What about platform teams or infrastructure teams? These teams have the responsibility of providing resources across cloud, locations, regions, zone, etc. For these teams, 
what we are doing is that we are continuously expanding our support for additional AWS and Azure regions. And since these cloud providers are moving also on-premise, we're also enabling OpenShift on AWS Outpost and AWS Wavelength. For those of you that runs OpenShift on vSphere, we're working on making way easier for you to deploy OpenShift on vSphere across vSphere clusters. So keep an eye for that. For the security teams, or sorry, for the platform teams. For the platform teams, they provide the tools for these creative minds that are the developers, right? For these teams, we're enhancing the OpenShift experience for doing Windows containers for disconnected or air gap environments. We're also extending the Windows container support to our managed offering, like Arrow and Rosa. Now, for the security teams. In OpenShift, we really prioritize the security as a core feature. It is what we consider a huge differentiator in OpenShift. With that, we fully embrace the zero trust philosophy, which means that we are aware and we assume that every single element within our deployment is regularly exposed to potential threats. With that in mind, in OpenShift, we are enabling the zero trust by focusing on managing identity, integrity, isolation across the platform. One example of such alignment is how we are enabling pod security admission in enforcement mode by default. But we don't stop there. To improve isolation, we are bringing user namespaces. With this type of namespace, if you have a privileged pod running there, and for some reason, somehow, it managed to escape, that process managed to escape that pod, it will be completely unprivileged. It has no privilege in the system. We're also en extending and enhancing the micro-segmentation for secondary network, aka the multis networks. Networking teams. Networking teams really play a crucial role in managing our connected lives or interconnected world. Far beyond wires and routers, their expertise is really what keeps our organizations and our applications connected. So we have not forgot about them. So to make their life easier, we are with OpenShift 4, we're starting with OpenShift 414, and we re-architected the OVN Kubernetes, and it has been enhanced such that it distributes the control plane to each node in that cluster. With that, what this new architecture allows is that each node in that cluster is the keeper of its own configuration, hence improving scalability, stability, security, and resilience of the whole cluster, even when nodes fail. And yes, we see our customer adopting more and more IPv6. So yes, we are enhancing the OpenShift uh, IPv6 support on public cloud. And we are extending that all across. And, and with that, I will leave you with Peter for the next part of this. Thank you, William. And is this thing on? Hello? I'd like to request the song. OK. So I'm Peter Lauterbach. I'm one of the product managers here, along with William, on the OpenShift team. And there's a couple of things we're going to talk about. But you'll see a thread that we've seen before, which is the device edge has really been pushing a lot of where we're going, right? The 
OpenShift ecosystem and all our integrations with ecosystem partners is fairly large, right? And running that on a new architecture is something Red Hat knows how to do very well, but it takes a lot of work and engineering effort and QE work to do that. And you'll see that thread all the way through here. So ACS is our solution, our cloud native Kubernetes solution for security, right? Which is doing vulnerability scans, doing policy enforcement. We're actually migrating that capability to run on the ARM platform, right? Which will enable device using that on device edge. Right? And device edge it could be something in a car, could be uh, a you know a small data center in a remote un, uh, remote undisclosed location, like a weather station, or it's under somebody's desk in a retail store. The other part, and this is a, a ACS and ACM are part of OpenShift Platform Plus, which is uh, uh, the packaging that lets you get all of the security and fleet management along with OpenShift. And what we're doing with ACM is extending the capabilities that we have today, right? So the first one is observability in terms of, right now it's all metrics uh, that are available, and we're making tracing and log analysis available as part of that observability. The other one is governance, right? So we're able to do progressive rollout, this is future stuff that's progressive rollouts of plans and then being able to do blue-green uh, deployments. Right? And this is something that you want to be able to use ACM to not only build and deploy your clusters, but upgrade them over the life cycle of your applications. And then the last one is scale, which is no matter how big we build stuff and how big people, you know, I have a 100-node OpenShift cluster, people want a 200-node OpenShift cluster, right? And being able to manage larger clusters and larger number of clusters, especially with device edge, right? That becomes super important because it suddenly goes from data center where I may have tens or hundreds of clusters in a particular building to now I've got thousands or tens of thousands of nodes in a particular region uh, of my network. <clears throat> Hosted control planes, um, uh, affectionately called hypershift, you may have heard that. Uh, this is something that's uh, become generally available in 4.14, which we dropped, was it last Tuesday? <laughs> and hosted control planes are a couple of different things, and I want to explain that. Uh, the first is it gives you the ability to take what is normally Kubernetes needs three control planes, and in the old traditional world, you would take three pieces of hardware and do that, and that was kind of inefficient. We've migrated to a, hey, you can create three virtual machines to be your control planes, but that's still a little bit clunky and you have to manage that. Well, HyperShift is different, right? It allows you to take the control plane functionality for hosted clusters and run those as pods. And they can either run on the management uh, hub or on a bare metal server all by itself. And this gives you a couple of capabilities that I'm gonna show you. Um, you can deploy it in AWS, you can deploy it on-prem with bare metal nodes, or you can deploy it with uh, KubeVert. Um, and that's actually what I'll talk about here. So this idea of if you're running, say, OpenShift on, say, uh, a traditional hypervisor platform like vSphere or Rev, this is a pattern you're familiar with, right? The installer goes, creates a bunch of VMs, sticks OpenShift in it, um, but at that point, you know, you're kind of managing each cluster independently how it gets created. HyperShift actually takes that whole cluster life cycle and uses the cluster API to make the cluster itself an object, right? So this is cluster as a service, if you will. So this will allow you to create a combination of either, you know, hosted control planes with virtual worker nodes in the node pool, and that'll give you the equivalent of what you have today or you can actually use bare metal node pools, right? Which actually then you can say, all right, I've got a virtual or a hosted control plane over here, but I've got big fat servers, maybe they're stuffed with big expensive GPUs, and I can manage that as a separate set in a declarative manner. And you're actually not using, a, it's, a, it's a whole different uh, installer, but it gives you full life cycle of treating the cluster as an object, right? In, uh, a cluster as a service. and um, Sometimes it's a little hard to understand that we try to do the picture as best we can. I'll be around if you have questions about it. Um, this is gonna be released with OpenShift 4.14 and ACM 2.9, 
which is mm, three or four weeks away. Um, we've talked about edge all the way through this, and this is where, um, as I said, the footprint is different, right? Whether you're talking an in-vehicle system or in a store or in a remote location. And uh, MicroShift is the piece of technology that we use to deliver this, right? It's a slimmed down version of RHEL that actually can run on a very small footprint with a limited and small amount of resources. That's generally available now, right? So right, has anybody tried this out? Show of hands, how many people are actually doing anything with uh, MicroShift? Okay, couple of hands, good. Maybe we'll come talk to you later. <laughs> so the idea here is the thread, as I said before, is a lot of OpenShift is a big, vast ecosystem, and getting that to run on a different architecture is something that we know how to do, and it really is making sure and understanding what are the needs, right? Do I need a particular piece of technology that needs to show up on ARM first? We'd love to hear your feedback, right? <clears throat> The other thing that's going to be super popular, and Chuck alluded to this earlier, right? The AIML story has, I'm not even sure it's peaked yet, right? It's still, it's still on the upward trend, uh, especially with the advent of uh, uh, generative AI. So this idea of having a platform that you could run where not only your data scientists and analysts can do uh, development of models and rapid prototyping, but actually serving of models across your entire infrastructure. Right? And the ability to do that in a consistent way with secure images that you've built in, uh, uh, with your software pipeline with uh, attested, <coughs> excuse me, attested images is something that you've been able to do with OpenShift and we want to make sure that you can do that for all your AI ML workloads. The other piece of that puzzle is NVIDIA, which has been a great partner for us. We've worked together for quite some time now. Right. And then there's the new version of their AI Enterprise 2.0, which includes a lot of the stack here, which is the operator and all the software that drives the modeling. Um, there's CUDA and there's a bunch of other uh, pieces in there that allow you to not only build models uh, to your specifications, but are actually optimized for the platform that you're running on, whether those are smaller cards that are running in smaller devices or as I said, the larger GPUs that are uh, uh, essentially a shelf of very expensive GPUs with a ton of memory that can slice through a bunch of training data very quickly. Right? And this is something that I think there's a whole boot demo uh, over on the on the floor show uh, the show floor over there. Lastly, um, it, let's talk about sustainability, right? Now that you're actually running all these things and you can scale up things effortlessly everywhere, it becomes very important and very conscious to know about what is your energy consumption, right? And in, in fact, I was kind of surprised to learn this. Many places have regulations that say, not only do you have to report on what your power consumption is for your compute farm, but you are actually mandated in some cases to move over to a sustainable form of energy uh, for some percentage of your workloads. So it's very important to see not only understanding how much power you're consuming, that's actually the very first step, right? And that could be hard to do in very different ways. So what we did is we took what we know about hardware and infrastructure, which we've done for, what, 25 years now, and baked that into a project called Kepler, right? And Kepler is a way to take that energy information and expose it in a way that Kubernetes can consume and analyze. And this is a very cool project we're looking at because it's going to enable you to do a couple of things. Right? First, the reporting and chargeback and understanding is a very, that's a very simple step, that's easy to do. But what if you can actually use that energy information and the demands and the workloads to make choices about where do you scale up, where do you schedule workloads and where do you scale them up? So lastly, and I don't know if we're ending early here or not, but that's okay, we're better early than late. So as Chuck said earlier, right, there's a couple of pieces that OpenShift does really well, and we wanna make sure that we can do that. So the idea that, yes, we're an opinionated version of Kubernetes that you can trust, right? And whether or not you use the pieces that we all deliver, including the SDN and the storage, 
or you swap out different pieces and use some of our partners, right? Whether that's ODF or Portworks or PowerFlex, right? We want to make sure that that is the trusted platform that you can use everywhere. As I said, the curation also, this idea of your application development should be a, done in a way that you can actually pick and choose the different pieces uh, that you want to deploy on. You don't have, you can use the things that we deliver, batteries included, but they're swappable. And then lastly, and this is actually the, the, the trickiest bit, is making sure that experience is the same and consistent across not only all the different versions of OpenShift, right? We're on a, we're still on a fairly rapid schedule of three deployment, uh, three releases a year, but the idea of running on a device footprint that's fitting in a car, or I'm doing something in a small office, or I'm doing something in a data center that spans multiple regions, that you get a consistent experience, whether it's on-prem or in the public cloud. And are we taking questions? I can't actually see here. We got questions. Uh, do we have a way to take questions? We have a microphone. Should we take questions? You tell me. <laughs> All right, we, got, we, have, we actually have time for a few questions. I, can I invite you back up to, <laughs> I don't want to be the only guy here. <laughs> Come on up, up, up. William, good to see you again. <laughs> You're way in the back there. They have oh. a caller from Milwaukee. Yes, sir. Yeah, we have uh, all this uh, going on, this uh, supercharged edge computing. Uh, are you doing any work in the manufacturing area where uh, this would be most valuable if you could uh, talk to the uh, programmable controllers, to the robots, to all of the welding machines and the other devices without having to program each of these things individually? That's a great question. Um, go ahead. So, <laughs> we might have to. Yes. So we, we are doing uh, integrations there with partners. Uh, I will direct more of that to the partner ecosystem. But I'm, I come from, from the field, and I'm aware that, yes, we have been doing uh, work there on creating even, for example, uh, part of the standards, integration with the standards for declarative communication with uh, specialized devices, I will just say. <laughs> um, I can put you in contact with someone from the ecosystem partner uh, team to better get you that information, okay? Thank you, William. Other questions? All right, well, thank you for your time. <laughs>